This video is about a woman named Ashley Ellerin, who was a beautiful young woman, only 23 years old, who was murdered in central Hollywood. Now, she was supposed to have a date with the actor Ashton Kutcher on the night she was murdered, and that's probably a large part of why we are even talking about her today, because of the very brief and very trivial association with Ashton Kutcher. But Ashley Ellerin on her own um, deserves mention because she was a victim of a crime which was quite horrific. And uh, she was always described as beautiful and outgoing, the life of the party, everyone who ever met her, whoever met her loved her, uh, according to her friends and, and her family. She grew up in Northern California and she came to Los Angeles to study uh, at the LA Fashion Institute. Now, she moved in with a couple of roommates into this house in central Hollywood. It's very close to Hollywood Boulevard in Highland, which is sort of the new Times Square of, of uh, Los Angeles. And even though it's a bustling area right there with lots of tourist traffic and traffic traffic, car traffic, and Franklin, which is where uh, her house is right off Franklin, it's very busy, very loud area but the house is behind some buildings and uh, quite, quite, actually quite uh, quiet, quite isolated, really. Uh, if anything were to happen in the house, odds are quite good someone would hear it in the neighborhood because it's, it's blocked off quite well from central Hollywood. Um, one day, Ashley's friend was visiting, and this was back in the early, uh, in early 2000s. And when her friend left the house, there was a, he discovered a flat tire. So Ashley and he were outside uh, fixing the flat tire when this guy came up, just happened to be walking by, introduced himself as Mike, offered to help them change the uh, the tire on the car. And he and Ashley sort of you know had this affectionate or flirtatious banter between the two of them. And he was a good-looking guy, and she was a beautiful girl, and, and they got on well, and she invited him in, and they became very friendly. He handed her a business card that said that he worked for a, like a, a, frig, a refrigeration or a, a heating company. And that evening, the heater went out, and she and her friend were talking. It was like, what, what, the, what are the odds of that? So they called the, uh, the business card that Michael uh, gave them, and had him come for uh, to service the the heater in the house, and the the, the friend thought it was as unusual as that the you know he went in to fix the heater, and it only took him a couple of seconds to fix it. So that that was in retrospect led the uh, the friend to think that maybe that was a bit more contrived. Uh, Mike actually walking up to them as they were changing the tire of the car was a bit more contrived than it seemed at the time. Now, uh, Michael Garjula was actually his name, and he lived very close by in an apartment building on Orchid Street, probably less than two blocks away, and it was a building called the Aimer Arms. And, um, and he began hanging around quite a bit around the house. He'd show up unexpectedly, knock on the door, and he was, you know, Ashley and he thought, you know, kind of liked each other. There was sort of a, I don't know, a sexy chemistry between them, although I don't know if that was ever really consummated. But he would show up, and he'd show up at parties that, that they didn't expect him to show up to. Um, now, during this time, he did mention casually, or or maybe not casually, but he mentioned that he was, he was under investigation by the FBI for a murder that happened in his hometown of Glenview, Illinois. A, f a neighbor of his by the name of um, Patricia Focaccio was murdered in August of 1993. And... He mentioned to, because I guess they found DNA under her fingernails, that he was a suspect in that murder. And he just sort of mentioned that to them. And that was sort of a red flag for Ashley and her friends. Go figure. And she started to distance herself from Garjula. They started getting a little bit more, I guess, creeped out by the guy. And um, so they, they just sort of, I think, I think he probably sensed the fact that they were, they were trying to, um, you know, just kind of, <laughs> kind of make more of a separation between him and uh, and them. So this building, he lived in apartment number 110 of the Amer Arms on Orchid, block and a half, two blocks max from the uh, from Ashley Ellerin and her roommate's house. 
Uh, my friend Hollywood Mary gave me actually the lease agreement of uh, Michael Garzullo when he applied to be a resident of the Amer Arms building. Uh, you could see on this lease agreement that he listed his employment as the pro gym, as a pro boxer at the at Hollywood on um, the Hollywood gym. I'm sorry, on La Brea, and he left his friend's name and his mom's name as a uh, reference. He was to pay $465 a month for rent that included utilities. He signed that lease agreement on November 3rd of 1997. And it's an interesting note that he, he mentioned on the lease agreement, no pets, and that he owned a drum set but he would not play the drums. He promised not to play the drum set. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, bit of trivia. And that lease agreement is actually in the Dearly Departed Tours uh, archives now. So thanks, Hollywood Mary, for, for providing that to us, for gifting us with that document, because it's, it's just an odd bit of, uh, of weird Hollywood history, which is what we, we thrive on. So um, now, on the, uh, on the day that she was murdered, which would be February 22nd, 2001. So previously she'd met Ashton Kutcher and met, I guess they, they, they liked each other and agreed that they would go on a date or, or get together at some point. And Ashton Kutcher asked her to go to this uh, after Grammy's party on February uh, 22nd of 2001. So on that very day, um, at 4 p.m., she spoke to Ashton Kutcher, and they were gonna. She confirmed the date for later that evening to this Grammy party, and that uh, if he was gonna, if he was gonna be running late at all, uh, he would call her to let her know. Now, around seven o'clock, Ashley had a visit from a friend who was also, uh, I guess, worked for the landlord of the building and she had some issues with a ceiling fan, but I think it was a little bit more than that because during that visit, he showed up around seven o'clock. Uh, Ashley and he were um, intimate, uh, but he, you know, he swears he was out of the house by 8.15 p.m. In retrospect, he was interviewed, but they were, this, this is a fact that she and this guy, his name was Mark, I think, were intimate on the evening that she, uh, that she died. So at 8.15, he swears he was out of the house. He got there about 7, left at 8.15. Around 8.30 p.m., across the street from Ashley's house is a dog park. And someone who was walking the dog to the dog park uh, claims he heard a scream around 8.30 p.m. He heard a scream. He was with his dog. The dog kind of, you know, uh, became alert and was staring at the house. Now, he heard two, actually. One, one was sort of a... An, an odd female sound. The second time was absolutely a scream, but he couldn't isolate where it was coming from. So, but he did check his watch, but he didn't call the police because I think a lot of times people, you know, when they're in situations like that, they think, oh no, it couldn't be, you know? And I, and I can't say I blame the guy either. If you hear something like that, you just go, no, it couldn't be because, um, because it just, you don't think it's, you think it's so unlikely that uh, something like that, you know, you're actually privy to that information, to that knowledge, you're hearing it happen live. So uh, I kind of get that that guy didn't call the police and uh, because he thought, well, that's weird, but it couldn't be. So, uh, and that was about 8.30 p.m. Now, Ashton Kutcher called her again at 10.15 p.m. That he was confirming that he was on his way and he was going to be late, but she did not answer her phone. He got to her house, he saw her car parked in front, the lights were on inside the house. He went up to the door, knocked on the door. There was no answer. Uh, so the door was straight in front of him. Next to him were these, with this three, I think three windows. And he peeked inside those windows and he got a glimpse of room inside and he saw dark spots on the floor, which he explained away in his mind, because again, if you're in that situation, you sort of think, no, it just couldn't be. Uh, he explained it away as red wine, uh, spilled red wine on the floor. I guess Ashley had had parties in that house before. And so it wasn't crazy to think that, you know, it may have been just spilled wine on the floor. In retrospect, you sort of wish he may have called the, uh, the uh, police because, because, but he just thought, you know, she blew him off. He, he showed up late, a half an hour late, 
and uh, she chose to just say screw it and didn't answer the door. And, and the, he, I guess he tried the door at that time too because he left fingerprints on the door. The next morning, her roommate Jen got home. I guess she'd spent the night with friends the night before or the night of Ashley's murder. And, uh, and she let herself in the house. She needed a key to get it into the house. All the doors were locked. All the windows were locked. I mean, there are bars on the window and everything. And, uh, so it was, it, was, it was locked down. The house was, was well locked down. And I understand that Ashley was quite concerned for her security. So she always made sure the front door and the, uh, and the back door were actually locked in the house. And her friend Jen got home the next day and let herself in the front door and found Ashley at first. Of course, it couldn't be. She walked up to, the, to Ashley's body and thought, oh, this is a joke, it couldn't, this couldn't be real. And she realized it was real and she, um, and she called the police. Now this is the actual autopsy report, Ashley Ellerin's autopsy report. And I'm gonna read what I can from this report. And it describes Ashley Ellerin. Now the address of the house, 1911 Pinehurst Road in Hollywood, California, Hollywood Hills, they say. They note the piercings, bilateral ear, navel, right arm, she had a tattoo, left ankle, she had a tattoo, and on her back, she had a tattoo. Uh, the synopsis, the decedent, meaning Ashley, is a 22-year-old, at that point they said 22, her other documents say she was 23 years old, a 22-year-old female whose roommate found her to be unresponsive on their hallway floor upon her return home. A 911 call was initiated. No forced entry into the residence. No obvious weapons were discovered uh, or recovered at the scene. Initial body exam revealed several over 35 wounds to the body, uh, many of which were penetrating. Several stab and cut type wounds noted to the head, neck, torso, and left leg. Apparent defense wounds noted as well to the right forearm and to both hands. So Ashley was not just murdered, but brutally, brutally murdered. Um, on February 22nd, 2001, at approximately 10.58 a.m., a call was received by the LAPD reporting the death of a 22-year-old female who was apparently assaulted at her residence. This detective who's filling out the form says, I was assigned to the investigation. I arrived at the scene at 5.15, departing at um, 19.30, which is what, 7.30, I guess. Uh, the murder location was the hallway of the residence at the address I mentioned earlier. According to the detective, on February 22nd, 2001, shortly after 9 a.m., one of the decedent's roommates returned home, discovering her unresponsive on the hallway floor. A 911 call was then initiated. Responding paramedics pronounced death at the scene at 9.28 a.m. She was last known alive uh, the night prior at about 2015. There were no obvious signs of forced entry into the residence and no obvious weapons had been recovered at the scene. At the time of the investigation, there were no suspects in custody. She was observed lying in the hallway, carpeted floor, which was a stair landing leading to two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a couple of closets. She was lying in an up, facing upwards, leaning towards her left, her head pointed north. Apparent dried blood was observed on the carpet adjacent to her body. Per the detective, body, bloody shoe prints were initially observed in the house entryway, which had been processed prior to this detective's arrival. The evidence, while at the scene, a hair and a fingernail kit were collected. Both items were placed into evidence. Uh, the body examination. The decedent, Ashley Ellerin, was observed lying uh, facing upwards, leaning towards her left. Her right hand rested across the front of her torso, with her left hand resting in a downward position, downward fashion, they say, on her left thigh. Uh, the detective was saying that her hand was sort of pointing to her, uh, to her crotch area. She was dressed in a light green bathrobe, a blue tank top, and blue shorts. Blood was noted to trail from both the nose and mouth. Several, over 35 stab wounds are noted about the body, many of which were penetrating. 
several stab and cut type wounds were noted particularly to the head, the neck, the front and back torso and the left leg. Apparent defense wounds were noted as well um, to the blood on the right hand which were collected by the LAPD. An obvious skull fracture was also observed to the back area of the head. The ambient air temperature was 60 degrees at uh, 6.25 p.m. The detectives requested a sexual assault kit. So describing some of the, uh, th some of the, uh, some of the documents. This said that she was found in the hallway, carpeted floor at the residence. And uh, this is just demonstrating that. Some of this will be repeated to you. It says that um, she was found by her roommate to be unresponsive on the hallway floor in the residence. Multiple sharp force traumatic injuries were noted. There was no obvious forced entry into the residence. No obvious weapons were present. The decedent was pronounced dead at the scene. It was apparent that she was dead, but she was finally pronounced officially at the scene. She's identified by toe tags and is that of a well-nourished, well-developed appearing, unembalmed adult Caucasian female who appears roughly the stated age of 23 years. The body weighs 123 pounds and measures 64 inches in height. She appears to be well nourished. The skin reveals trauma, including multiple sharp force traumatic injuries to be described below. Tattoos are present. There's a tattoo depicting a wheel present on the lateral right upper arm and shoulder area. There is a tattoo depicting a wheel present on the lower back above the buttocks. There's also a tattoo representing an ankle extending an anklet, sorry, extending around the left ankle. The extremities show multiple defense type wounds present on the hands bilaterally and also on the right forearm. So she clearly gave up a fight, clearly gave up a fight. So um, there are a total of 47 sharp force traumatic injuries, including stab wounds and incised wounds, 12 fatal wounds. Now, some of these will be, um, I'll note some of them, I'll mention some of them, because there are, there are way too many to go into specifically. This one they call stab wound number seven. This was a sharp force wound noted to the back of the neck, six and a half inches below the, uh, the top of the head, they say, I guess, the vertex. And um, a roughly V shape measuring three quarters of an inch by one eighth inch, with two sharp ends. The path of the wound is through the scalp, through the musculature under the lower scalp, penetrating through the cervical spine. Wound number 11 is an incised wound present at the right side of the neck, one inch to the right of the posterior midline. It is a large gaping defect measuring four by one and three quarters inches. The trachea has been severed a short distance below the larynx. Also, the right carotid artery and right jugular vein have been severed with the resulting extensive hemorrhage. I believe these are the fatal stab wounds being, uh, being noted. Wound number 15, a wound to the upper right back, a gaping wound with a sharp end noted superiorly and a dull end inferiorly. Uh, hits the thoracic spine, also extending through the posterior chest well into the right lung, approximately two inches deep. This is a wound number 16 to the right back, 16 inches below the vertex or the, the top of the head. It's a large gaping defect through the posterior chest wall and ribs and enters the right lung. Stab wound number 18 gaping defect measuring up one and a half inches by five eighths of an inch. Um, the wound extends downward through the ribs of the posterior chest wall and entering the left lung. Wound number 19, stab wound to the back located in the posterior midline. Large gaping defect measuring a total of two inches. The path is through the skin and underlying tissues between the ribs and to the right lung entering the right lung. This is angry. This is really upsetting mutilation. I mean, it's not just boom, boom, stabbing. This is proper mutilation. Wound number 20, 
uh, penetrates through the skin, through the ribs, through the pleura, through the left lung, through the diaphragm and entering the spleen. Wound 22, left back. The stab wound involves the skin passing through the rib cage and entering the left lung. Stab wound 26, through the soft tissues of the anterior neck, transecting the left carotid artery and left jugular vein with regional hemorrhage to the cervical spine, uh, uh, stab wound 27. The path of the stab wound is through the skin, through the third intercostal space and entering the right lung. Stab wound 28 involves the skin entering the perit peritoneum uh, and then entering the liver. Wound number 25, through the skin, through the abdominal wall and entering the liver. The depth is approximately four inches. Uh, sharp force traumatic injuries, many of which are non-fatal. Uh, there are other non-fatal stab wounds present involving the back of the head. St those are different numbered stab wounds through the right posterior neck, through the stab wound to the right chest, non-fatal, non to the left shoulder area, non-fatal, to the back are non-fatal, to the left knee area, non-fatal, defense wounds, um, it's, it, it's just incredible what this poor woman who fought for her life uh, ended up experiencing. Um, it's quite, quite awful. When she was found, they, uh, or when she was brought in for her autopsy, they mentioned the clothing that she was wearing at the time. A green terry cloth blood-soaked bathrobe is what she was wearing. Approximately 12 defects are located in the back area. Those would be the holes from the stab wounds. Many of these are slit-shaped, consistent with stab wound origin. Four defects are noted in the front. Two defects are present in the right arm area. A blue tank top, blood-soaked. Five defects are noted in the back, and two defects are noted in the front. The rest of it is a lot of technical jargon involving her organs, her neck, her chest activity, respiratory system, etc. Her gastrointestinal system, which would be what, what was in her stomach at the time, uh, brown semi-solid food material, no hemorrhages are noted. Yeah, appendix is normal. Pancreas, normal. The opinion by the coroner that the cause of death is multiple sharp force traumatic injuries. This include 12 fatal wounds involving injuries to the lungs, liver, spleen, diaphragm, and uh, fracture, traumatic. They say dislocation, fracture, and possible traumatic to the brain and cervical spinal cord. Defense wounds are present on both hands and the right forearm. The manner of death is homicide. Every single stab wound is noted in this, uh, not, uh, you know, as it should be in her autopsy. But so many, every, well, each of the stab wounds were noted. And they did drug testing. Well, actually, it seems like the only thing they tested for was alcohol, which was negative. It says, you know, they they, they, it's a non-determined for barbiturate, cocaine, meth, opiates, opiates. I guess that means that they did test it and nothing came up. It says non-determined not detected. So apparently they did do testing for, for that sort of stuff. So back to the, uh, the narration, actually. So no, no arrest was made uh, until 2008 when Michael Gargiulo, who's now named, or was nicknamed at the time, the Hollywood Ripper, who was her neighbor, was arrested in 2008 and charged with the murder of Ashley Ellerin and two other women as well as an attempted murder of a third. Now, the, the, there was a woman by the name of Maria Bruno who was stabbed and mutilated to death in El Monte. This was in 2005. This is a couple of years ash, after Ashley Ellerin. Interestingly, Michael Gargiulo at that time was living in El Monte, very close to her. And L.A. Sheriff's Department released a bulletin uh, asking the public to help with the investigation. Um, now, interestingly, when he killed Maria Bruno, he left behind a, a blue surgical booty that he, I guess there, he was very careful because there was no DNA found at Ashley Ellerin's, only hers. So they did all the testing, figuring there was so much blood at the scene because they say she was, they say she was practically drained of blood at the scene. 
uh, when they when she was discovered, but there was no DNA aside from hers found at the scene. And the guy that she, you know, met up with earlier on that day, I guess there was no DNA left from him either. But he came clean. He came clean, as it were. He came clean straight away, you know, and, and told, you know, detectives what had happened earlier in the day. And he was a suspect for a minute, but, uh, but quickly ruled out, as was Ashton Kutcher. Actually, when Ashton Kutcher heard about it, because he looked in, you know, saw the spilled red wine, which is, you know, kind of weird, but is it worthy of a phone call? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, those close to her think it was, but um, again, I can understand how looking in a window and seeing spilled red wine would be, you know, it couldn't be. Probably didn't even even enter his mind when he got back in his car and he left and went to whatever party he was heading to. <clears throat> so they found this bloody booty with his DNA on it, as well as Maria Bruno's DNA. To clarify, when Gargiulo's apartment was searched, a matching booty was found hidden in his home. So after Maria Bruno in 2005, he moved to Santa Monica. And what do you know? In April 2008, another neighbor of his was attacked by the name of Michelle Murphy. Uh, he had slipped in the uh, bedroom window and she woke up to this man on top of her, attacking her, stabbing her. And to her credit, she fought him off. She fought like crazy. And she injured, injured herself quite seriously when she was fighting him. It's quite awful to imagine, but she's grabbing the knife. You understand it. You understand it happening, but she's grabbing this sharp knife with her hands. She ended up with pretty, pretty serious uh, injuries of her own, but she lived. And, uh, and the DNA, uh, he left DNA. He left DNA. It became quite clear because he lived in close proximity to both uh, Ashley Ellerin, or well, the three of them, Maria Bruno, Bruno and Michelle Murphy, who wasn't murdered, but he lived so close to them, as he did back in Glenview, Illinois. He was neighbors with all these people, and they say he stalked these people. He stalked them. But he was arrested and charged with murder. Now, 10 days after his arrest, uh, according to one report, he tried to get out. He tried to escape, actually. They, uh, they say, I'll read this. He snapped off the head of a plastic spoon that had been given to him for a meal. He whittled, it, whittled the straight piece down to a point with his teeth and tried to unlock his handcuffs, tried to unlock those handcuffs. Uh, it was apparently videotaped. He talked about being locked in, let alone sitting in a chair, climbing up into the ceiling, running down to another part of the building, coming down, popping out a window, jumping and running over a fence. L.A. County Sheriff's Detective uh, Michael Staley testified later. He also talked about, quote, disabling the jailer with a throat punch. He was a boxer, remember, stating that he would be, it would be a fatal punch. The escape never happened, but an extra charge of attempted escape was added to the case. Now, when Ashton Kutcher heard about Ashley Ellerin's murder, he went straight away to the detectives because I guess his DNA was found there, fingerprints on the door or something like that. So, he, I, you know, I'm sure that he was shocked and I'm sure that he probably wanted to nip it in the bud as far as, you know, being investigated for any of this. It became clear that Ashton Kutcher had an alibi, as did the other, you know, suspect, the Mark guy who worked for the landlord who was fixing her ceiling fan, who, you know, said he got there around 7 and left around 8.15. And the witness across the street in the uh, dog park who heard it at 8.15, or 8.30, I'm sorry. So somewhere between 8.30 and 10.45 is when Ashley Ellerin was, was murdered. Now, it took till 2021. Gosh, it took that long to get a conviction for Ashley Ellerin's murder. It was being delayed, 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 and finally they charged him with first degree murder and he was sentenced to death for the murder of Ashley Ellerin. Two counts of first degree murder and sentenced to death, which in California means he'll spend the rest of his life in a fair amount of comfort with his meals delivered to him every day at San Quentin Prison. Um, a few years ago, there was a vote, and the, the people of Los Angeles County, or the people of California, voted for the death penalty actually to be expedited when people are sentenced to die. Uh, in, in, however, by execution, uh, the people of California voted, and it was passed through votes 
that uh, that the uh, that it be expedited, that people don't end up on death row for 50, 60 years. Um, California agreed that that should happen. However, the governor said, no, that's not going to happen. He decided on his own, we're not going to do that. It's inhumane, it's racist, and he put a moratorium on the death penalty, and there it stays. So Michael Gargiulo leading a comfortable life with three meals a day. Meanwhile, at least two women uh, who have been murdered by him, probably third, because he's going to be extradited back to uh, Illinois for the uh, and be charged with the murder of Focaccio at some point in time. So, um, so these these three women will rest forever in their graves, hopefully resting, and uh, and uh, and the poor woman who got away and was able to testify against him, thankfully, and uh, you know Michael Gargiulo, go to hell. When I was there the last time, I decided to walk from Ashley Ellerin's house to demonstrate how close she was to Michael Gargiulo's apartment building. And this time I took it slowly, and I figured I'd show you some other things on the way. But by proximity, it's so very close. But here are a couple of things that you will see um, if you do that walk yourself. Now, a couple of other things happened around here. See that building right there? That is a gymnasium for Hollywood United Methodist Church. And inside that gymnasium was the Enchantment Under the Sea dance in all three Back to the Future movies. It was also used for the uh, rehearsals for Sister Act 1 and 2 in the movie. And it was also used for the high school dance talent contest in That Thing You Do. Now we're on the other side of the park from the Ashley Ellerin house. Yeah, that, uh, that brown wall that you see over there, that's the house from this side. So I'll show you Gargiulo's place. And also the church here, Sister Act uh, used the church. So a lot of stuff that happens around here in a very small amount of space. You see that uh, parking lot over there behind the gas station, one of the Sunset Strip killers, the victims, was was shot back there was killed back there she was a prostitute and the two of them picked her up at that little strip mall across the street where it's just liquor we saw the scars going in that direction and they brought her back there and murdered her behind that gas station see so ron franklin That building, that white building on the right, Manson used to live there. And the thing that kicked off the Manson murders, the Helter Skelter, the Tay LaBianca murders, was actually an attempted murder of a man named Bernard Crow, AKA Lots of Papa, a drug dealer who Manson thought he killed and did not. But Manson didn't know that. And that happened in that empty lot that you see right there. There's the Magic Castle an old mansion that's now a club. It's exclusive to magicians and their guests. Charles Manson shot Bernard Crow and left him for dead, but he wasn't dead. And that really kicked off a lot of the Manson madness in August of 1969. But we're heading over here because the Hollywood Ripper, AKA Michael Gargiulo, lived in a building on this street. So you saw how quickly we walked from Ashley Ellerin's house. And this is where Gargiulo lived at the Amer Arms. Hello, Mary. My lovely friend Mary is probably watching. That uh, brown brick building that you see over there right where the garbage truck is now going to be slamming around. Uh, it's called the Amer Arms. 
And that is the building where Michael Gargiulo lived when he murdered Ashley Ellerin. And my lovely friend Mary, that building was in Mary's family for a long, long time. And Mary actually donated one of the most, one of the more interesting uh, items in the Dearly Departed Tours collection. It was the lease, the lease that Michael Gargiulo, the application and lease for his apartment here at the Amor Arms. So Gargiulo lived here. And Ashley Ellerin was murdered just up there. <laughs> 